As you know, one of the aims of the Supergen Energy Networks Hub was to try to connect energy systems researchers with a broader set of disciplines and bring new, new ideas and uh, new disciplines into, into the energy system space. And today, um, I think we're, we're certainly doing that. So today's speaker is Professor Kirsten Eder. Oh, just to say, we're recording this session, just so you know, and so we can make it available uh, on the internet later. Um, so hopefully you're all okay with that. So Kirsten is the Professor of Computer Science uh, at the University of Bristol, and she heads the Trustworthy Systems Laboratory. Uh, and Kirsten uh, looks at um, how to verify and explore the behavior of systems and the, in terms of their functional correctness, security, performance, and specifically of interest to us today, energy efficiency. Now, as we know, in our sector, a lot of people are putting a lot of faith in digitalization and advanced control algorithms to help us deliver the low carbon transition. But uh, what's important to uh, recognize is that digitalization and algorithms do consume energy and therefore produce CO2 emissions as well. And so it's important to think about that. And um, Kirsten's going to tell us amongst a number of other things about um, a term called energy transparency. So we'll, uh, I'll hand over to Kirsten in just a moment. And then um, at the end, I'll, we can have a, a session for your questions and we'll have a Q&A. So thank you very much again for attending. And Kirsten, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And um, I would like to talk to you about whole systems energy transparency. And that is a concept that I consider critical in the delivery of energy aware computing. And in particular, I would like to focus on software and on giving more power to software developers, literally, uh, if you so wish. Now, energy transparency aims to enable software developers to write cooler code. And whether this code runs on embedded systems, mobile devices, or it controls the large scale systems that help predict the weather, for instance, energy efficiency is the limiting factor in system design. In fact, energy has become a primary limiting factor in the development of all systems. Whether this is because of the cost of energy, or the amount of cooling that is required in larger systems, or simply because of the battery life in mobile devices. Now, if we consider the global scale, on the right-hand side here, you can see different nations, and they are listed here according to their electricity consumption, with the highest first. If we were to look at the ICT sector as a nation, then it would rank sixth in the energy consumption or electricity consumption, that is quite high. The ICT sector uses 3.6% of the global electricity for its operation. That is considerable. Now, the bad news is that predictions suggest that energy consumption through electronic devices will triple until 2030. And that is because of a massive rise in overall demand. Now, in less than 10 years, the same scene can look very different. And there are officially now more mobile devices than people in the world, and that has been the case since 2014. Now, all these devices consume energy, which we only become aware of in many cases when the battery of our devices is flat halfway through the day. Now, the reporter here quite rightly says and requires or requests that app makers must take energy optimization more seriously. And this calls for energy aware system design with a focus on computing. Now let's look at the system stack, the computing system stack that is. Low power design has been the focus for hardware developers for more than two decades really. 
and they have been enormously successful. They have developed power management that allows designers to focus on minimizing and optimizing both dynamic as well as static power. And during operation, there is a lot of sophisticated power management on ship, which you can see in different modes as an end user, perhaps, standby modes, suspend modes, sleep modes, etc. Now, low power electronics has been a really great success. But is that really where the greatest savings can be made? This was the question that motivated me to look into this area, um, well, about 10 years ago. And in my search, I found an article that contained this figure. And it suggested that the greater savings can be achieved at the higher levels of abstraction in the system stack. But unfortunately, this article was mostly geared towards hardware developers. And I'm a computer scientist, and I know that because system stack, the computing system stack, doesn't stop at the architectural level of the hardware. There's a whole software system stack on top. And indeed, that was recognized um, by the hardware development community, which clearly pointed out that the question is whether we can take the actual use cases into consideration and optimize the software to power the logic circuits down. The Design Automation Conference is a big um, conference where the hardware community meets, in particular those designing hardware and also those prov providing them with the tools to design hardware. But what's interesting in this article is it concludes that we should put a challenge to the software designers to see how much power they can save. So the ball has been firmly in our court. Well, if you look at the date, 2011, for at least a decade. Now to take stock, huge advances have been made in power efficient hardware, which is why this starts with green at the bottom. Uh, but in practice, the potential energy savings enabled by low power hardware are often wasted by software that doesn't exploit them. So in other words, software doesn't do a good job. This is why I want to focus on software. Software ultimately controls what the hardware does. And that means the algorithms, the data flow, the compiler optimizations. But traditionally, software design goals focus firmly on performance, performance, performance. Software engineers typically are blissfully unaware of the implications that the algorithms they choose, the coding style they use, the data structures have on power and energy. At best, power and energy can be secondary design goals. But we already know that the biggest savings can be gained for optimizations that are done at the higher levels of abstraction in the system stack. This means algorithms, data and software. Now, when I started in this area, I looked a little back in the literature to see what I could find. And I found a really interesting article. Software design for low power. I thought, ha, this is what I need. And this article starts in a really entertaining way. <coughs> it starts with, it is tempting to suppose that only hardware dissipates power, not software. However, that would be analogous to postulating <laughs> that only automobiles burn gasoline, not people. In microprocessor, microcontroller, and digital signal processor-based systems, it is software that directs much of the activity of the hardware. Yeah, I thought, exactly. And this interesting article finishes on a really important note. It gives key steps to align software design decisions with energy efficiency as a design goal. I thought, yeah, that's exactly what I need. What do we need to do? The first step, choose the best algorithm for the problem at hand and make sure it fits well with the computational hardware. And then there is a little warning. Failure to do this can lead to costs far exceeding the benefit of more localized power optimizations. But hang on, which software developer tries to match the algorithms they choose to the hardware that executes their code? 
For decades, we have moved software development away from hardware. That increased productivity and portability. And in fact, many software developers have no clue as to how their code will be executed on hardware. This is now problematic. This article then suggests minimizing memory size and expensive memory access. It also suggests optimizing performance of the application. Maximum use of available parallelism is one key factor of this. Taking advantage of hardware support for power management. These are all the different modes that the hardware developers have offered us. And finally, selecting instructions, sequencing them, and ordering operations in a way that minimizes switching in the CPU and data path which is what the hardware designers do. Okay, now normally I would ask, how old do you think this article is? Um, but this is a bit tricky in this type of online presentation. So let me surprise you. This is from 1997. So we've known about this for a very, very long time, yet not much work has been done on this. Any of you who develop software probably haven't got a tool that tells you how much energy will be consumed by the software um, that, that you're developing. Well, I don't have one of those. And how are we going to do this if we don't know how much the different options that we have available actually cost? So the question of how much is critical because what we can't see, what we can't measure, that we can't optimize. And this led us to introducing the concept of energy transparency. Energy transparency means that information and energy usage is available for programs, ideally without executing them, and at all levels from machine code to high-level application code. Now, transparency is a concept that works in other areas of life, and it helps us make more informed and hopefully the right decisions. What you can see here is the back of a rail ticket in Italy, and that shows us different means of transport and um, different uh, destinations and the CO2 emissions um, associated with those. So in terms of energy consumption, what we need is not just a single value. We actually need energy consumption functions that are parameterized by certain aspects of our code. For instance, the size of the data. So energy transparency is so important because it enables a deeper understanding of how algorithms and coding impact on the energy consumption of a computation when executed on hardware, so that as developers, we can make the right decisions. In a nutshell, we can't improve what we can't measure, and energy transparency is a key enabler for us to be able to do this. Now, the first hurdle, of course, is how do you measure the energy consumed by a program? Now, this is actually quite simple. We introduce a shunt resistor into the power supply of the processor. And then we measure the voltage drop across, across the resistor. We measure the voltage at one side of the resistor. Now, inside there was a power monitor. It contains an amplifier and an analog to digital converter. And that changes the signal that we are measuring in the way that is shown on this slide. Now, if we repeat frequently and timestamp each sample, then we get data like this. Then of course, what we see here in green is the energy consumed, which is the power over time. And it is possible to collect quite a bit of data, especially if you do this in bursts. Now, why doesn't every software developer do this? And I think the problem is that it requires you to physically interact with your hardware. And although soldering is easy, it is still not part of conventional computer science programs, nor is it typically part of the skill set of software engineers. And this is why um, back in 2012, we started to develop an energy measurement board that is openly available that anyone can produce. Now, it's a decade later and you can find commercial solutions. But I think we were the first who produced one of those uh, for everyone to use. This bridges the gap. It's open source and you can download it and have it manufactured. Now, being able to measure means 
that you can make interesting analysis. For instance, dynamically, as software is executing. And I worked with a group of second year students to do exactly this. They developed a simple energy aware computing framework, which they called ECOF. ECOF is available on GitHub in case you want to use it. Now, what they wanted to do is they wanted to take energy data from providers such as the CPU or battery or the hard drive into a central authority that then holds all the energy consumption data and can forward it on demand to the consumer applications, such as, as your email client, your video player, your web browser. Now, in order to do this, they needed to develop the system, the ECOF um, central authority, and that was part of their second year project. Now, applying this framework and showing what you can do, they looked at different sorting algorithms. And they sorted integer values between 0 and 255, which they simply encoded using 8, 16, 32, or 64 bit integers. So it's the same data, but represented using different bit width. Okay. And so they picked a number of algorithms. They are from different complexity classes, so it's not fair com to compare them against each other. But according to uh, the rows, you can make comparisons because we run the same algorithm across the different data representations in order to find out what would happen. And I just want to highlight a few things here. We measured time, energy, and then also the average power for each one of these. And if you look, for instance, here for insertion sort, the 32-bit version is obviously more optimized than any of the others because they're all higher in terms of the energy consumed uh, than 100, whilst the 32-bit version is not. So there's some interesting optimization going on there. And if we look at another example, we can look, for instance, at um, these two search sorting algorithm, merge sort and quick sort. They show us that sorting 64-bit values takes less time. So we're focusing on the right here. And that takes less time, we're in the time column, than sorting 8-bit values, which you see on the left-hand side. But what is interesting to note is that sorting the 64-bit values, although it takes less time, takes more energy than sorting the 8-bit values, which you see on the left-hand side. Now, we can have an interesting discussion with computer architects might, why this might be the case. Um, but the point here, and this is what I want to focus on, is that without the transparency, we wouldn't even be able to have this discussion because we would be unaware. And this is what energy transparency enables you to do. Now, it's all good and well to do this online because these students basically did this uh, dynamically as the program was running. But really, you want to support the developers. And you want to do this ideally statically without consuming energy in the process, so without running the, the program. We want to perform static analysis. And our first project in this was a future and emerging technologies project, which was funded by the European Commission, and it was running between 2012 and 2015. It was funded under a program that was um, aiming to develop software models and programming methodologies that support the strive for the energetic limit. And this project was called Whole Systems Energy Transparency. Now, static resource analysis um, dates back or, or uses algorithms which are traditionally used in resource usage analysis um, for execution time. So we adapt these traditional algorithms to energy consumption. These techniques automatically infer upper and lower bounds on energy usage of a program, and these bounds can be expressed using monotonic arithmetic functions per procedure. And these are parameterized by the program's input size, for instance. And then you can do verification statically by checking that the upper and the lower bounds on energy usage and any other resource defined um, in the specification actually hold. Now, this is all a bit technical. Let me illustrate this. Imagine we have a resource such as time or energy, and we want to specify how much of it is okay to use for a program. So on the x-axis, we have the input data size, and on the y-axis, we have the resource usage. 
and we have the upper bound here and the lower bound here, which gives us this pink corridor, which is our specification. We then write the application and we analyze it in terms of its actual usage of the resource. And you can see in blue here the upper bound and at the bottom the lower bound, and you get this blue corridor. And then you can perform verification in the sense that you can identify exactly where both of them coincide and meet, which is right here in the middle, shown in green, where both of them um, occupy the same space. So there our specification is met. The program meets the specified resource usage. There are areas where we are not really sure, which are shown at the bottom here in pink and labeled unknown, where you may or may not meet your specification. And at both the right and left hand side, at the far right and left, you can see that the blue corridor and the pink corridor do not overlap. So that is where the specification is not met by our um, program. So there, our assertion uh, would be incorrect. Okay. And that can all be done using programs in order to give the developer an idea as to how well they're doing with the development of their code. Now, in practice, this looks as follows. We have the original program, which is a very simple program here. It's um, a factorial program. It's taking an integer. It has a simple um, comparison at the front um, um, in the code or as the first instruction and returns one. Uh, if the comparison is met. Otherwise, there is a recursive call. Now, if I wanted to know how much energy is consumed by this program, what I would need to do is I would have to extract cost relations for this program. And these cost relations work as follows. The cost of a call to the factorial program is the sum of the cost of, well, first of all, this comparison here on the left-hand side, which I've labeled A, plus the cost of the return, which I've labeled B. And that applies if X is less or equal to zero. However, if X is greater than zero, then I still have the cost of the comp comparison. So I have to do that comparison. And then I add the cost of the recursive call. And then I have to determine how the recursive call um, is composed. Well, the recursive call, the cost of the re recursive call is the cost of the multiplication plus the cost of the next call, okay? And so it seems to be really simple. All we need to do now is to find these costs. So we substitute these, these constants there, these costs, with the actual energy required to execute the corresponding low-level machine instructions. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that um, because, first of all, we need to know how much that costs. And that gets me into the interesting area of energy modeling which captures the energy consumed during computation. Now, when it comes to energy modeling, there are different considerations. The first one is at which level should we model? There's of course the source code. There is then the source code that is transformed by the compiler into the machine code. So there is an intermediate representation layer in the compiler, and that is also possibly a target for modeling energy consumption. And there is, of course, the instruction set architecture level, that's the machine code, or the ISA level. Okay. Now, the transformation from the source code to the ISA, uh, to the machine code, is done by the compiler. Um, the developer writes the source code. Um, measurements are much easier to be done at the ISA level but of course they're more useful at the source code level because the models require um, these measurements to be taken. And that means we need to associate the entities at the given level of abstraction with specific costs, namely the energy consumed. And unfortunately the accuracy is best at the lower level, but of course providing energy consumption data is most useful to the developer if it's done at the source code level. So each line in an editor, you want to know how much it costs. And if I change it, is it getting better or worse? So that's a bit of a dilemma. Okay, so we started modeling at the lowest level um, in order to get the biggest accuracy we can achieve. 
And so when it comes to this, to machine code, the energy cost of a program can be determined by first of all, uh, looking at all the instructions, machine instructions in the program and determining their base cost. So there is one base cost for each instruction. And then I also consider how the circuit changes state between instructions. And I need to take each instruction pair and determine the circuit state switching overhead. And that's also something I need to consider. And then of course, there's lots of things going on uh, that are really, really hard to determine, um, which are to do with the internal architecture of the, uh, of the device. Okay. Uh, now this, let me just go back one. This is actually not new. This is from 1996. So we've known about this for a long time, but it hasn't been taken further for more than a decade. If you look at a modern architecture, then in addition to this, what we need to consider um, in a multi-threaded uh, processor and a multi-threaded program, which we mostly have these days, is how much it costs for the processor to be idle, to do nothing, and how much it costs to have things executing concurrently. And we've done this and we got to reasonably accuracy, um, a margin of less than 7%, um, was good enough for us to get a really good publication on this. Um, and so, yes, when we do this measurement, it does look messy on a desk. You really have wires and things sticking out. Um, but that has helped us to determine an interesting heat map. So in this heat map, what you see is um, arithmetic logic instruction for the XMOS X core processor using 32-bit data. And this is ordered by the number of data items that each instruction um, is crunching. So on the left hand side, we have two, opera two, two operand instructions, then we go to three operands, four, five and six operands. These six operand instructions are long multiplication instructions, which are often used in cryptographic algorithms. Now, it's not surprising that those instructions that crunch more data will um, consume more energy and those which are crunching less data, um, well, accordingly consume less energy. Um, but what was surprising us is that when we run the same experiment with 8-bit data, you can see that the heat comes out of the system and it's actually much cooler, far less energy is consumed. And that basically means each time you write a program where you write int x, you really should consider whether you need the bit width that your machine supports for an integer and whether an 8-bit representation would actually be sufficient. So if your loop only goes from zero to 100, you don't really need 32 bit. You might be better off with 8 bit data um, for the planet, that is. Uh, so careless use of, of um, data types can result in significantly large amounts of energy being burned. And that was a really key insight. So this helped us develop energy models and we used or, or found an energy consumption figure for each machine instruction in exactly this way. Now we want to use these for energy consumption analysis. Similar to looking at um, um, houses, we wanted to, to look at how much energy is consumed by code. Now, static research analysis, as I said, um, we wanted to start at the instruction level because that's where we get the highest accuracy in terms of modeling. So we combine our static resource analysis, which I've introduced before with the uh, verification uh, pictures and the, the um, blue and um, pink corridors. We wanted to do this using the energy consumption model at the machine instruction level. And that should provide us with energy consumption functions that are parameterized by some property of the program or its data. Okay, so we have our source code, we get pushed this through the compiler, we've got our machine code, we perform the analysis at that level using the cost model from um, our heat maps. We've seen this before, we are already familiar with this, and now we actually can substitute these costs, provided that our our um, costs reflect the machine instructions, not the source code instructions, right? So you can do uh, the extraction of cost relations, not just at the source code level, but actually at the machine code level as well. So if we did this, 
then we use a off-the-shelf solver to solve all these cost relations and indeed we get an energy consumption function um, so we've got a nice linear energy consumption function here and um, these lines compare effectively the static resource analysis with a simulation and a hardware measurement as well and we were very pleased with the results and of course you can do this with other codes as well so that just shows a few other functions that we've been able to derive but hang on this is at the machine code level so it's not really that useful for the developer um, so we really want to move the analysis to the higher levels but moving away from the underlying model risks losing accuracy although it does bring us back to the higher levels that allow for optimizations to be done so the compiler can optimize at this level here in the, in, the, in the middle and it also pushes everything closer to giving more understanding to the system developers so that might solve our dilemma now the problem is we can't directly characterize at the higher levels because the accuracy is highest at the lower levels so what you see on the on in this slide here is on the left hand side you have the transformation um, the code on the left hand side here is created by the compiler and that is then lowered into machine code so the transformation goes from left to right now on the right hand side for each entity we know exactly how much it costs and so we use a trick to lift this energy model to the higher levels by remembering and tracing back where each one of these instructions came from and then summing up and associating the related machine cost instructions to the higher levels of uh, high, higher levels of abstraction and with this trick we can then lift our energy model which we previously had the, at the isa level we can lift this to the higher level using a mapping and then we can use exactly the same resource analysis but this time we're using this higher level energy model and we can then associate um, uh, compiler constructs with costs and that allows the compiler to make more energy aware energy efficient decisions and if you look at a large set of benchmarks we're actually not doing too badly we are within plus minus 10 percent of um of um, the hardware measurements and that's not badly done at all if you do this statically you can also see a simulation which is profile based and that is also not um exactly accurate so doing this statically also at the ISAM versus the um, intermediate level of the compiler you know it, it, it's okay it's acceptable and that's actually good progress now most of us are researchers i suppose and the worst case for us is to have a publication rejected and we got our papers frequently rejected because we did not claim that we did a worst case energy consumption analysis and that is because energy is data dependent so we always said this is an average analysis it is not a worst case analysis and the community didn't like this now if we look at this this is all look, looking pretty good and and has got given us good results but if you remember the graph that we just looked at um, had both over and underestimation um, and this is because we associated each instruction with a single cost we used valid data for each instruction and then uh, we measured across the valid data range and took the average and we associated that with the cost of each instruction now if we zoom in if, if we consider the analysis that we use um, remember this is a bound analysis um, and there is a fundamental mismatch between the model which is an average energy consumption model and the analysis which is a bound analysis and in most cases we are we are interested in the upper bound the worst case now worst case execution time analysis has been around for decades and it is mainly used for safety critical applications such as for instance the brakes in your car um, and worst case execution time analysis uh, relies on a worst case execution time model and that is possible for execution time in synchronous circuits and these worst case execution time bounds have to be safe which means they don't underestimate and tight which means they ideally don't overestimate because otherwise it becomes pretty useless the question is does this really work for energy consumption analysis now worst case energy consumption analysis goes well beyond the analysis of worst case execution time 
And that is because embedded systems are time, that are timing predictable, they execute instructions in a fixed number of clock cycles, which is usually given to you by the hardware manufacturer. And so the worst case execution time only depends on the worst case execution path. And any variability in terms of timing has been mostly designed out because we are dealing with synchronous logic. In other words, if I take the clock cycle away from anyone who does worst case execution time analysis, they will really literally have a very hard time. But energy consumption is data dependent and we found this out by digging a little bit deeper. Let's have a look at the subtraction instruction, which is right here in the middle and it's nicely green. So that suggests medium consumption of energy. But if you actually split this up and you do it for every bit pattern exhaustively, you know, um, on the y-axis you've got operand one, on the x-axis you've got operand two. So subtract operand one, so, so subtract op one, op two means I take opt operand two from operand one. So if we take 160, for instance, as long as I subtract values that are lower, smaller than 160, I get nicely blue and low energy consumption. As soon as I subtract something that is higher, I get into the reds. This is a consequence of the way um, negative uh, data is encoded using two's complement uh, encoding. Um, but that explains why we see nicely green in the average, but actually it's pretty useful to know where you stand in terms of this graph because you're either low or high. So this gives us um, an insight into energy consumption actually being data dependent and you really ought to know if you want to do worst case where you are in this graph. So we did this for subtraction, addition, shift left and, and, and logic and, and we found yes indeed it is data dependent, that's not good news. Um, in fact, we all know that A times B is the same as B times A. But the question really in terms of energy consumption is, is the energy consumed by A times B the same as the energy consumed by B times A? And if that was the case, then this graph would be symmetrical on the diagonal that I've put into here. And you can clearly see it's not. So that's interesting in its own right and gives rise to potential optimizations. Now, what we found is that um, the dynamic energy can be quite significant, as large as 30%, and some instructions can cause as much dynamic energy as static. Now, how can we account for context-dependent switching costs? And can worst-case energy consumption be safe and tight in the same way as timing is? Now, this triggered a whole lot of research because we wouldn't have our papers rejected indefinitely. And we found that the critical questions for worst case energy consumption modeling were really which data would, should be used to characterize a worst case energy consumption model. And that led us to the question of which data causes the worst case energy consumption for a given program. And that means asking the question, which data triggers the most switching during the execution of a program in the hardware? Now, these are all very, very hard questions to answer. And that led us to a complexity analysis. We needed to determine the switching costs. And we, de we determined and found, our research found that this is NP hard. The amount of computation required increases exponentially with the program size. The, pro the problem cannot be approximated accurately. So that means no algorithm can efficiently find worst case dynamic energy. So we need to ask other questions. Is a less general solution acceptable? and what level of inaccuracy can be tolerated. And eventually we published a really significant and groundbreaking paper. So for the younger ones amongst us, do not be put off when you get rejected, okay? You need to do what's right, not what's easy, because the easy thing would have been to declare that we've done worst case and it would have all got accepted. And we would have made exactly the same mistake as everyone else has made. Okay, now let me sum up. To achieve energy transparency, we need to tackle the energy modeling challenge. And that is a huge challenge. There are very fundamental research questions still to be answered. Data dependency, compositionality, and we probably have to resort to probabilistic techniques. We also need to invest more into analysis techniques for energy consumption. Static analysis works really well for small devices. 
And we're currently working in a much larger project looking at drones, medical devices, um, where hybrid and profile-based techniques um, have to be used because the architectures are much more complex and we're also getting into real large systems. So drones, for instance, um, and, and medical devices, as I just said. So what I really want to call for is energy aware software engineering. Energy transparency has been something that has been available for hardware developers for a very long time. For hardware designers, power is a, is a first and last order design constraint. Um, I've seen an interesting presentation from 2009, so that's really long ago, where they said every design is a point in a 2D plane and that's a hardware developer, right? So for every design, they get visibility on optimizing energy versus performance. And they can then find out where the optimal points in the system design can be reached. But software developers don't have this, which is why we need to give more power to software developers. What I want to be able to do in my code is I want to write something like in five picojoule do. And then the system tells me whether that's possible or not. I want full energy transparency from hardware to software. I want location centric programming models. And it would be really interesting to do a cool code green software um, uh, project where we can call for a cool programming competition. Um, and I think that's a really big challenge that we should address as a community because promoting energy efficiency is a first class um, to, to become a first, soft, first class software design goal is a really urgent research challenge. Okay, so this leads me um, to thanking all the, the uh, funders of our research and this pictures contains um, all of us in the group that have been mainly contributing to the, well, current state of the, of the art and to our success in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten, for an absolutely fascinating talk and um, really um, revealing to start to think about the software as being um, really important from an energy consumption point of view. I think in the energy system space where we're used to thinking about the hardware um, affecting uh, what happens in terms of the efficiency of a power electronic converter or, or such like, but the fact that the software can affect it as well is, um, well, certainly to me, quite a new perspective on this and really interesting. Um, I put in the chat earlier, the network, the electrical network companies are putting RTUs, remote terminal units out onto the grids in their hundreds, if not thousands at the moment, in order to collect data, analyze that data, process it in using the kind of operations you were talking about, and then make control decisions uh, using uh, sometimes AI techniques and others to control the grid to help decarbonize it. Um, but I'd be very surprised if any of those people are actually thinking about um, energy aware software engineering in the development of those algorithms. Um, really interested to hear about your idea of a competition. I wonder whether we could actually um, do something with the Supergen hub with you there, Kirsten, where we could take a hardware platform that is used now out on electricity grids and, and look at a, a control algorithm that's required for renewable energy or something, and then have a look at the energy consumption of that by retrofitting the equipment. Uh, and then making a competition for who can reduce the energy. That could be really interesting. I, I think there is a lot of merit in this. I mean, you can fund um, uh, research projects that find you point solutions. And there are actually quite a few in terms of energy of computing, where you know, the energy consumption of particular programs on a particular hardware platform have been optimized. But that is ultimately uh, not going to solve the problem, which is why my research group concentrates on making energy consumption transparent and we always emphasized that we are not aiming to optimize per se we are making transparent so that others can optimize that enables a large community um, to optimize and you know if the raspberry pi is a good example i'd like to see the gooseberry pi i'd like to see the one that has the energy meter integrated 
so that the kids who are programming them, the next generation, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a Fitbit. They basically can look at it and say, well, my program consumes less than yours. How did you do that? And mm -hmm. this transparency will drive the competition between developers. And if we could do this from an end user perspective, you know, in terms of apps, you only find out whether an app is a pocket warmer when it's too late, right? But if you had as an, as an end user control and you could see star ratings like with white goods on apps, you would probably go for the one that is lower energy. Um, and so there could well be a, a, a time when, when this is being considered um, so that we, we become more aware and there is um, more drive towards making tools that, that make energy consumption visible to developers so they can learn and by learning and having this, this insight, you will automatically, you should be going for the most optimal solution. Now, in the, in the project that we're currently doing, the Team Play project, which is an H2020 funded project, we're not just looking at energy. We're looking at time, energy and security. Because sometimes you might want to go for maximum security and that comes as a cost and you make this cost visible. And then other times you might say, okay, it's really important that the device comes back and the energy is used for the flight back. Um, and, and in that case, you might, make, what you might be prepared to compromise on security or maybe yeah. even on time. Yeah, fascinating. So could I open it up? Does anybody have any questions? I can see uh, where he has made a comment about the way that people have tended to try and do this is decarbonize the energy rather than necessarily reduce the consumption. Um, any other comments or questions? I can see Miriam is in the is uh, in the audience today and Miriam works on electric vehicle charging, smart charging for thousands, if not millions in the future of electric vehicles. They would certainly have control algorithms, software. Um, so it might be, um, I don't know, Miriam, if you have any thoughts, if you're there or we're here. Is we're here still there? Yeah. Any questions anyway, please come in. Okay, Miriam is posted. Would you like to speak um, to us, Miriam? Okay, um, so. Or Ji Hong, so, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Because I, 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 I use someone else account, so initially they split a different name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't spot you there. No, that's right, yeah, okay. Go Just ahead, a quick, quick question for Kirsten. And we, we do a lot of simulation modeling work and use the software. And we just uh, try to make it work. And uh, so we, we really never considered about energy consumptions on that. So do you think there's any kind of uh, ways in, in our practice to, 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 in our programming, we can, we can save energy and we can yeah. embed that into the programming? Uh, I would be very surprised if you can't. But as you can see, this is a very young discipline. And we are, mm. you know, the, the, the first bits were the funded future emerging technologies, right, under this heading. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we're making first steps towards, towards understanding how to do it for larger systems. So it, it works pretty well for small systems. Mm. Um, uh, and we're now expanding it into larger systems. Um, and... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently submitting, in, in the process of submitting a, a proposal uh, where we're looking at the energy consumption of websites, because mm -hmm. lots of people are, are high level developers and, um, uh, you know, supporting them with, with the tools uh, and an understanding as to what costs how much is, is pretty useful. So I think you will have to wait for a little bit until the software developers that develop the complex simulation software that you use have mm -hmm. the right tools available for them. But I would be surprised if there wouldn't be significant savings. Um, yeah. Because the, 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 the article that, that I got back to, you know, from 97, clearly suggests it's the algorithmic level, it's the decisions that you're making at that level that influence the energy consumption. But unfortunately, most people don't consider that at all at that stage. So we are stuck mm -hmm. with this. And that controls what the hardware does. Now, the hardware has developed enormously over the, the last decades. And in many cases, the software doesn't use the important features that the hardware has to offer. 
there is a big gap. And, and as software developers, um, you know, we've benefited from the speed up in the hardware. Often we don't need to optimize the software because the hardware, the next generation of hardware will be faster, so we don't need to worry. And we benefit from that automatically. Um, but now we are at the stage where it's really important that we step a step back and we bridge that gap. Uh, and the tools are coming, but it will take a little while. Mm -hmm. I, I just got the feeling when, when, when I started to study computer, everything on, you know, with program using DOS. And uh, the, now we use Windows, so it's more user friendly. And so that's a computer scientist designed a complicated program that make us to use it easily. But I believe that's probably cost more on power and the resources. And um, quite like when, when I was postdoc, I did a lot of the C programming. When I become a lecturer, and after a couple of years, when I come back to try and program and become visual C, when you open the platform, it suddenly generate a pile of things, and I completely lost. I believe all this, the code becomes very big, and that's kind of a waste. And so it's, it's like a, a like uh, one aspect of benefit from that one aspect that you lose this uh, kind of uh, economics, yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a trade-off, it's a balancing act, right? We, we, yeah. have, we have achieved, we actually, we have made great achievements in terms of um, uh, performance, productivity, and, mm -hmm. and portability of software. Yeah. But this, this, is, this, is, this is now um, a, a, um, a showstopper in a sense that this may prevent us from, from having more energy efficient computing which is why it's so important to not just put the burden on the software developer, but actually to develop tools that, that um, go through these layers that obfuscate what happens and that give you the information so that the compilers and the tools can either do it behind the scenes, which is what we're doing in the team play project, or they can give the developer the information, uh, well, I should say, and they can give the developer the information. And you can then learn that actually when I use this sorting algorithm, I use that amount of energy. And, but when I use that, it used this, like the second year student in the project found out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think if we had a culture where we at least could see how much is consumed by which option, we then learn which options are the green ones, mm -hmm. which is why such an, an, a, a competition would be quite insightful. Yeah, it's so interesting. That's really opened my mind because I never thought about this before. It's really, really interesting. Topic. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we plug it into the, the wall and it works. And we get yeah. annoyed when these run out of power prematurely. But the people who develop the apps do not have sufficient visibility of how much will be consumed. And that oh, is yeah. what we need to crack. Yeah. So, so Kirsten, um, Thank you very much. We're, we're close to the end of time now. You can, I don't know if you can see the chat here, but um, there's a comment about, I think generally about the fact that we've got more and more edge computing and decentralization in energy systems, energy networks. And then also Matt Deakin asking, when do you think, uh, how long do you think we'll have to wait for some kind of profiler for, for a high level language that calculates energy performance rather than just speed performance? Is that years away, a decade away? What do you think? It's, it's not years away. So in the team play project, so if you go and, and, and say H2020 team play, and I can put it in the chat after this. Thank um, you. There we have um, complex um, software that controls drones and also the algorithms that they use in order to do um, processing of data, visual data. So they, they, they are... Um, set, uh, rescue drones that go along the coast and search for uh, people that are stranded. Um, then um, those for those uh, s sorts of applications, they are written in C, we have already got uh, power profilers. So it's not that long. And there are papers that we're writing on this, there are deliverables, you can see how we did the energy modeling for this. And um, there is a power profiling tool but it's not in the mainstream uh, development tool chains yet. Right. So it's, I don't think it's decades that you need to wait. And I think <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a species, we should have a vested interest in it not being decades again. Agreed. Because it's interesting to see that the roots of this research were already there in 97. 
Why hasn't mm. anyone picked that up? Yeah, good question. Well, Kirsten, thank you. Um, I think we'd certainly like to keep talking to you from the Supergen Energy Networks hub and see whether there's some work uh, we could do uh, with you to bring your skills in. Um, lots of great feedback here in, on the chat, so thanks, Kirsten. But um, yeah, let's, let's hope we could bring your skills into the Supergen Energy Networks hub, maybe do a competition or maybe set up a little research project. Uh, we can find some hardware that we know is used regularly with some typical smart grid software algorithms and maybe do some work together on that. Would be 